welcome everybody hello hello it's nice to see some i can see occasionally some names and faces that are wifting by <laughs> and it's nice to see you um so you know i have been in many ways building a framework to talk about the issues that disrupt the ability of people to actually listen to each other particularly when they have differing points of view and also when they're in conflict and they experience the other person as intentionally hurting them or harming them. Uh, pretty much all of the classes that I've been teaching both in the course that's called Living Together Without Falling Apart and then also in these uh, individual courses that are uh, online for the Rose Center, as well as uh, for my own Real Dialogue, uh, I have been building up the framework to help you see something about uh, homo sapiens, about human beings. And I find as I get questions uh, after each one of the classes, that there still is a kind of interesting, interesting obstacle that I, um, I, had to, I had not expected. And this morning I was listening to Sam Harris interviewing Yuval Harari. You all know her, Noah Yuval Harari, I think it is. And of course, I'm a great fan of Harari's, particularly his book, Sapiens. And I noticed that Harari was also facing this obstacle that I think of as something that has been clarified, but apparently it's not easy to clarify it. And this is the obstacle. Many of us who care about our relationship to the planet, to each other, to other species here want to make changes in the ways that we behave in our relationship to our planet and other species. And we seem to think that if we have really good ideas and really good data, we're all going to uniformly want to do the same things. And then we seem also to be puzzled when that doesn't happen. And it seems as though there's a kind of idea that if we just make a stronger argument for our own point of view with more data and more ideals tacked onto it, that the other side is going to be convinced that we're right and that they will just automatically come along. And I find again and again that conversations about climate change about the pandemic, about what we're going to do next, go in the direction of we just have to get ourselves together and do the right thing. And oddly enough, it seems as though there is one side that thinks that they know the right thing to do. And I often really only listening to that sort of, I mean, I'm in my own echo chamber too. It's, I don't listen to a lot of conservative podcasts or, or a lot of people who support Donald Trump. Uh, I, I do listen to some and I have talked to a lot of them. Um, but you know, here is what I think is very, very obvious. We need both sides of every conversation. And there is no way that we can do this thing of making these changes in the way that we relate to what we regard as our planet, other species, unless we can work with our own. We just can't do it. And until we can do that, what we will face again and again is conflict. And sometimes that conflict is so dangerous and so overwhelming, not just to our species, but to the environment overall, as in the case of nuclear war or as in the case even of civil war. And so I don't know why it isn't more clear that 
if we want to achieve these goals of living more harmoniously on the planet, of being able to put together a framework for handling our niche here so that we don't dominate and consume everything. If we want to do those things, we have to work with our species, number one. Because without that, we ain't got nothing. All we've got is the repeated wars again and again and again. One team against the other, one tribe against the other, one set of ideals against some other set of ideals. And then the constant humiliation and rage, you know, that one side sees the other side as stupid or uninformed or, you know, uh, or badly motivated or intentionally harmful. And so I think the sooner that we can clear up the idea that we have to work with the whole species, not just with our own team, the clearer we can, the, the better it will get, the more clearly we can move then towards developing something like a true dialogue. Because dialogue is not necessary until you're in conflict. You know, if you actually agree with somebody, if you have consensus, you can just chat. You can just do something like, you know, have a discussion about something you agree about. But when you have a genuine difference, then you have to actually do something that is very different than make your case, predict the future, gather your data, talk about what you believe and how ideal it is. And that's where all of these skills come in that I've been talking about. And the skills that I'll be talking about today, which have to do with listening, uh, and listening is the most difficult component of a difficult conversation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the Harvard Negotiation Project and have listened to a number of the people that work there on various podcasts. And one of the podcasts that Sheila Hain was doing with Shane Parrish a while ago now, um, talking about difficult conversations, and that's a kind of term that's out there about people who are unable to come up with the means of handling problems in their work settings um, that you know have recurrent uh, have a kind of a recurrent uh, tendency like things having to do with differences of race and ethnicity or gender and so on so uh, human resources have what are called how the questions of how to handle a difficult conversation. And Sheila Hain was talking about it. And the podcaster said, so what's the secret? And she said, it sounds sort of stupid to say this, but the secret is listening. And the total, total secret is can you listen when a conversation goes into various topics that you disagree with and that you are reactive to? And, you know, people cannot seem to do that. So I have been working on this project called Real Dialogue for, well, really in some form or another since about 1984, when I wrote a book about dialogue therapy, and I've been doing dialogue therapy with couples since then and have written three books about it. And um, now I'm working on a fourth. And the, what I found is that the methods that couples need to use in order to be able to listen mindfully to each other when they're in conflict are exactly the methods that need to be used when you're having a difficult conversation. And so today we're going to talk especially about listening and listening um, when you're activated, when you're triggered. And we're going to talk a little bit again about emotion, about human emotion and what it is. Uh, but before we do all of that, and as I did on Saturday in my class on um, being stuck in a, sl a snow globe, which is the way I think of our each individual worlds that we're in these little bubbles or snow globes that are very hard to see outside of. We can, we can though, train ourselves to listen outside of our snow globe, and that's a mindfulness training. 
It's a training of your own reactivity. Um, and I read a, a little portion of a Mary Oliver poem on Saturday and talking about our snow globes. And it's from this collection that's called The Leaf in the Cloud. And I'm going to read a portion of, a, of another poem in this little collection. Mary Oliver wrote this collection on her, her 60th birthday. And it, it's, it's her attempt to teach what she has learned in her life up to that point. And um, the, the passage I read on Saturday was about the fact that as, as human beings, our job here is actually to talk and to listen. It is not the job of silence. That's the job, she says, of the orange gourd or the rock. And it's not the job to move swiftly. That's the job of water. Our job actually is to use language. And in this passage uh, that I'm going to read, she has a beautiful way of saying what I hope will then inspire you to uh, listen more carefully and then to go into some of the material that we'll talk about today. So she says, it is our nature not only to see that the world is beautiful, but to stand in the dark under the stars or at noon in the rainfall of light, frenzied, wringing our hands, half mad, saying over and over, what does it mean that the world is beautiful? What does it mean? The child asks this and the determined laboring adult asks this. Both the carpenter and the scholar ask this and the fisherman and the teacher. Both the rich and the poor ask this, maybe the poor more than the rich, and the old and the very old, not yet having figured it out, ask this desperately, standing beside the golden-coated field rock or the tumbling water or under the stars. What does it mean? What does it mean? So I like to introduce the framework of listening in this bigger framework of the idea that it is the job of our species to talk and to listen, to ask the question, what does it mean? What does it mean that we're in the middle of this pandemic? What does it mean that we're locked down here in our homes? What does it mean that we're isolating socially? What does it mean that we're wearing masks and not exhibiting our faces to each other? What does this mean? And the only way we can answer this is to talk to each other about it. You cannot get to an answer inside of your own subjectivity because of your self-deception. You cannot know yourself well. You're 95% unconscious. You can only know yourself in reflection with the others. And if you cannot hear others when they talk about things that you don't agree with, then you're much more likely to fall into deeper self-deception. And remembering, as I've said many times and say over and over again in my podcast, what we call the human self is interactive from the beginning. It is not inside of your brain. It is not inside of your head. It is not inside of your body. You come into being in interaction with someone else. You're inside of that person. You come out of that person you have eye-to-eye -eye contact right away. You need that person desperately to understand you and communicate with you because you're completely dependent. And so the human self is an interactive process. It cannot exist on its own, not at any stage of the game. And so it is our job to speak to each other and listen to each other. And it is our job to ask, what does it mean? What does it mean? And in that way, we are not like rocks, we're not like the water, we're not like the trees, and we're not like the other animals because they're not asking these questions. So that sort of sets the stage for today. Um, so now I'm gonna go into a few of the ideas that we'll be talking about. But let me say something first about prediction and control. I've said that, um, I've said some things about this in other, in other classes, but 
I just want to remind you that um, the Homo sapien, the human being, uh, actually has a rather large frontal and prefrontal cortex in the brain that predisposes us to try to look out there and figure out what's going on. Right behind our eyes is something called the limbic system, which predisposes us to protect ourselves when we feel threatened. And it predisposes us also to protect ourselves in the same ways we learned to protect ourselves in the beginning of life when we were so vulnerable. So we have a tendency to recreate the experiences of emotional threat that we had in our early lives. And when we feel threatened in conversation by somebody or because of their behavior, we tend to want to protect ourselves and promote ourselves in the ways that we did previously. And so instead of actually listening, when we're emotionally threatened, we begin to predict what the conversation is going to be like, and then we begin to protect ourselves, defend ourselves, or promote ourselves in the same old ways. And that is not your fault. That is part of your design. And when you realize that it's part of your design, then you can actually work to overcome it. If you think it's your personal problem or the problem of your family of origin or the problem of your partner or your sibling or whoever else, then you cannot work to actually overcome the obstacle because you think it's either someone else's problem or it's your problem personally and you're defective. So right away, when you realize it's part of the design to predict and control, and it's part of the design to feel emotionally threatened in the same old ways, you can begin to work with that. Hey, this is the package I came in. It's not my fault. It's not their fault. They're not doing this to me. This is the way it is. So that's where we're beginning today. And um, so let's put up the first slide, Laurie, on um, this is the first sort of step in thinking about how we can listen to difficult conversations. The very first thing that we have to develop, and this is, by the way, I'm sorry to say a skill, and so it doesn't come naturally, uh, that's mindfulness. And mindfulness is a certain quality of awareness. And you can cultivate it just the same way that you cultivate, let's say, your, um, your physical stamina by you know, doing various exercises or going out there and kind of working against the um, entropy of your muscles. Mindfulness is a kind of awareness that combines concentration and equanimity, and it leads to clarity of perception. Now, we're not going to be doing that very thing in this class today, but whatever you do to practice this thing called mindfulness, which you can practice in a number of ways, um, it doesn't have to be meditation, though meditation is a very good way to practice. What you have to recognize that you are trying to increase and develop is a certain kind of awareness. That awareness allows you to pay close attention to what's actually happening in the present moment and to concentrate. And the other side of the awareness allows you to relax and welcome your experience. So concentration, if it's very intense, is like being on too much caffeine. And equanimity, if it's very intense, is like falling asleep. So when you put the two together, you have the concentration plus the relaxation or the openness you have greater clarity in your perception. And your perception here, I mean your eyes, your ears, your taste, your body sensations, what we call ordinary perception, as well as your ability to know what you're doing, that is to be conscious, to know what you're thinking, to know what you're feeling. So mindfulness is this quality of awareness that combines concentration and equanimity. Compassion, so, okay, bad news, mindfulness is a skill, you've gotta develop it, you don't come designed with it. Good news, compassion is natural. Human beings have natural compassion. We're born with it, we need it in order to soothe our mothers, bring them around to a state of happy concentration on us, and also 
uh, to sue those of, that it might be around us. I mean, I've mentioned this before, but um, babies that are twins or triplets or quadruplets uh, who are sharing the womb, uh, many times when they're born prematurely, they share the bassinet or the place where they're sleeping and they soothe each other right away. And we, we know now that they soothe in the womb as well, stroking each other's arms and doing things to soothe each other. We know how to soothe from just being here as human beings. So the ability to accompany someone when they're suffering or in adversity and to actually offer some sort of soothing and help is inborn. Now, you can develop it and you have to develop it if it's going to be very useful so that you can actually talk with somebody about what they need and then it becomes more accurate in the way you're helping and, and you can develop a true compassion, which is a kind of accurate empathy plus the desire to help. So compassion itself though, which is the desire to help or soothe and to actually make things better for another human being is natural and you will notice that in yourself when, you're walk, when you walk by someone who, for example, might be in trouble or begging on the sidewalk, uh, for you to actually walk by that person and ignore the person, you have to do something inside of your own mind to do that because you cannot naturally walk by. You want to help. You want to be involved. So this combination of mindfulness, which is the skill that you develop in order to be able to clarify your perceptions, and compassion, which is the desire to actually help others and even those in your own species, uh, together they make it a little easier to learn how to listen to difficult conversations. So um, I'm gonna move then to the next uh, component of the class and then I'll stop for questions. Uh, let's put up the next slide, Laurie. And this is a slide that I have put up before I, um, this is this, a slide that looks at our self-conscious emotions. And um, I want to uh, just review these and the timing of when, we, when they develop and what they signal in our species. So these are called sometimes our secondary emotions or our social emotions. These are the motivators that allow us to feel like we're inside of a particular body and the world is outside of us. They also motivate us to protect ourselves in groups, to compare ourselves to others, and to, and to count our beans to see if our beans are equal with others' beans and so on. So the self-conscious emotions activate what, um, I'm gonna use Carl Jung's terminology here, uh, activate what Carl Jung would call an ego complex in all human beings. In other words, these emotions, which come on board around 18 months to two years, bring about the formation of a sense that we're an individual subject, that we're inside of this body, and that we're stuck in here with a world outside of us and others outside of us. So they motivate us to compare ourselves, to promote ourselves, to protect ourselves, and again, these are universal, no matter what culture you're in, no matter what your family was like, no matter what your language is. And there's lots and lots of research around this stuff. So I'm just giving the quick takeaway on it. So these emotions, uh, the self-conscious emotions, are um, by and large um, irritating experiences. They're, they're negative motivators. And when I say negative, I mean they cause us to contract and protect ourselves rather than expand and enjoy ourselves. Uh, the expansive emotions uh, are always in the minority for the uh, homo sapiens. And so consequently, we're more motivated to see what's wrong, to see what's not working, to see what's unjust, to see what's unequal, rather than what is working and what we're doing that's actually working well. So I'm just gonna go over the names of these self-conscious emotions. This is kind of review. If you've been following the, this class and, um, and to say briefly which ones are the ones to truly pay close attention to when you're listening to somebody 
with whom you disagree. So um, shame is the, the desire to cover up, lie, die, because you feel like you're defective, either because you're inferior, or you can feel superior uh, and feel like you're isolated like you're so much smarter than everyone else that nobody can understand you, for example. That's still a shame. It's a, desire, it's, a it's a feeling that you're defective and set apart. Guilt is the desire to repair a bad action or wrongdoing, and envy the desire to destroy or diminish what somebody else has because you can't have it for yourself. Um, shame and envy are two really problematic self-conscious emotions. And the reason they are is because when you attempt to speak to another person's faults or you think about what they're saying and you think it's wrong, if you have a tendency to blame them, you will shame them. And that then leads to that feeling of humiliation. So if you come into a difficult dialogue and you begin to say, no, you're wrong about that, or don't you remember this or that, the other person can easily feel humiliated and then become enraged, and then there's no dialogue at all. They begin to fight, flee, protect themselves. Uh, envy, also very difficult emotion because it motivates this desire to destroy somebody else because you think they have more than what you have or they have an advantage that you don't have. And so envy also can break down any kind of conversation really quickly if you actually feel that somebody else is set above you or you convey to somebody else that you're superior to them because then they'll want to knock you down. So in a nutshell, um, when you're trying to lower the emotional threat level in a difficult conversation so that you can actually hear what somebody is saying, you need to be alert to your own feelings around humiliation, shame, and envy. Um, so there's a lot more to say about the self-conscious emotions, and uh, I won't be saying most of those things today, but right now I'm going to stop for some questions, and then we're going to go on and we'll talk a little bit about this idea of an ego that we defend by finding somebody else wrong or bad or inferior or just deplorable or out of the question or unable to learn or whatever it is that we put out there um, and then how that makes it difficult to listen to that person once we've labeled them that way so um, that's where we're headed we're going into that material but from what i've presented so far you know i've talked about the, the issue of what it means to be human asking the question what does it mean how that's our job and then how we need each other in order to answer those questions or that kind of question. And then how our self-consciousness gets defended so quickly by trying to predict what's going to happen, trying to control what's going on, and then also feeling like we have to promote and protect ourselves. So I'm um, ready to hear some questions and see if, uh, if this so far is clear. Yes. Um, so this is just more of a statement than necessarily uh, a question, but someone writes, uh, I'm specifically dealing with someone, a close relative of mine who has a worldview that is a science only, no spiritual perspective whatsoever. Um, they say, for me, the oneness, the connectedness, intuition, a higher power is my reality. He expects me to back anything I say or think with a peer-reviewed science paper. It's exhausting. So Okay, so that's a really, really good question. I think it's a very good example of a difficult conversation. So if you are entering this con conversation, as it sounds like you are, from what you regard as a spiritual perspective, then you regard, first of all, this other person as being extremely valuable in conversation with you. So you might begin, first of all, by remembering that this person is valuable to you. And by doing something to lower your own emotional threat level, and that could be breathing deeply, it could be using some sort of mindfulness technique, 
It could be actually just slowing down and noticing the feeling of the air on your face, the feeling of your clothes on your body, all of which lead to equanimity. They lead to more openness to your experience and less self-protectiveness. And then in that state of greater openness, you could ask your friend in conversation something like this. You know, I'd like to understand why it is so important for you to um, see things in a scientific perspective. And then as that person begins to tell you, if you could imagine that that person is actually part of yourself and that you're trying to understand the reason why you're having a conversation with this person, I'm assuming the person is your friend, or if the person is not your friend, then it's a coworker or somebody that you're needing to get the job done. So you begin to understand that this person is part of you and you want to understand what it is about that scientific perspective that inspires your friend, that actually gets your friend to feeling like this is the most important thing in the world, is this scientific perspective. And as you go into that, you might try to you know, paraphrase what your friend is saying. We're gonna to get to that in a few minutes, but your very first position is to begin to see that that other person is part of this oneness that you're advocating. This person is not separate from you. In this moment, this person is actually in your environment. From a Buddhist perspective, they're arising with you. And your job really is to use your natural compassion to help them arise with you in a way that they're connecting to you, and then also to cultivate your mindfulness so that you can come to see and hear that person for what they're trying to convey to you. So your first step when you go into that conversation is to recognize the person as part of you and to realize that that separation that you're feeling is a defense of your ego. So, um, you know, there are further steps, but that's the first step. We'll be going into some of the other steps in a little while. So, so we have another, another yeah, another question is, um, do you have a definition for humiliation? You've said the word several times, but there wasn't a definition on the slide. Well, humiliation, um, you know, sometimes I use it interchangeably with shame, but it's like the doer side of shame. It's like, if, if I am shaming you, I am in some way, implying that your social status is beneath mine and that your place in the group is not as important as my place in the group and so i am trying and maybe you know maybe i'm motivated to shame you to protect myself but i am in some way lowering your social status and you're experiencing that as having your weaknesses exposed and they might be exposed in a conversation or they might be exposed if there are others in the group. And so in, you know, when, when Homo sapiens were hunter gatherers, uh, if somebody's weaknesses were exposed in the group, they could die from that because they might be le left behind uh, because they would be seen as weak and not capable of going on with the group. So when somebody feels their weaknesses are exposed or they're exposed as defective in a human situation, they're very, very eager to rectify that. And usually the response is rage. And so very often in conflicts, a one party will begin the conflict by saying something about the other party's defect the other party's uh, faults or defects or stupidities or mistakes. And so beginning with that uh, always produces a bad outcome. Uh, it always produces uh, the defense in the other person. And I think we talked about humiliation um, 
perhaps in the last class that that we did um, I, I'm not I get some of these classes mixed up now either either I talked about it in Saturday's class on the snow globe or the, the class before uh, and in any case I, I think if you tune in and you look at um, my last class for Roe uh, I believe I talked about humiliation and rage in that class so um, humiliation is when one person uh, feels exposed and as though that that person's status is lowered in the group but that person is also feeling shamed and being shamed and so it connects to the shame cycle and the uh, the rage humiliation cycle is when two uh, human beings go back and forth between um, humiliating each other and becoming enraged so is is there anything else uh, out there that I need to answer right now Lori or can I move on? Um, I think we, we can move on. There's a couple more questions, but we can circle back to them at the end. Come back to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let, let's put up the slide on the ego complex. Um, and so again, you know, what I'm trying to do in all of these classes is kind of give you the owner's manual on being a homo sapien, you know, that there, there are a number of things that are in your design that are not, Jung called these archetypes. You could call them um, primary um, kinds of imprints or uh, structures within the design of being a homo sapien um, and once you know they're there then you can work with them if you don't know they're there you might think they're the fault of somebody either yourself or your family or the other people around you so um, you know a lot of times I like to give these in the framework of a developmental process in humans because obviously we have a very, very long childhood, and we go through many stages of development from being absolutely helpless to being uh, completely mature. That is, if everything goes well, mature organism, uh, human being organism, and it's, it's roughly mature at the age of 25 years. And uh, um, by that age, if you're a regular person and you've had a regular development, you have an identity complex that um, Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud called ego. It, it really refers to simply the sense that there's some continuity and coherence. You have a personal narrative. You experience yourself mostly as being inside of your body, except when you're sleeping and dreaming or you're traumatized, you might pop out of your body, but your identity is connected with your body and you have a narrative you have a story about yourself and you also have this feeling that you've gone on being for a while and that you are responsible for your actions that you cause your actions and your speech now all of these things a narrative or life story the sense of being coherent and having an identity and also having this feeling of agency or autonomy that you govern your life, you make decisions and so on. These are in all cultures and they're emphasized in different ways in different languages and cultures and so on. So some cultures de-emphasize an individual autonomy and they more emphasize a group um, or a family identity. Uh, other cultures like North American cultures, we emphasize a great deal of the individual identity and the individual responsibility um, and so on. But there's no human culture that doesn't have this ego complex, this sense that, that people, human beings are inside of their bodies, the world being outside, and that they're responsible for the things they say and the things they do. So all cultures have laws and rules about that and how you weigh one thing and another. And there's an expectation that a, an adult has certain kinds of responsibilities from having these abilities to govern their lives, to say and do things. In other words, we as human beings regard ourselves as agents or as causal agents. We do things, we say things, and we regard each other as being responsible for doing and saying those things. Um, this, there's, there are so many important issues that surround this idea 
but I'm just giving a very little taste of them. The, um, the really important piece of this to get a hold of is that you ascribe certain things to yourself and that self is always interactive with others and you like to keep the good side of things within your own identity and you want to get the wrong or the bad sides outside of your identity by and large. And so you're generally sorting out differences so that you are on the right side and others are on the wrong side of the issues. And that's again, part of your design. Um, also, you're doing this other thing that's a little hard to explain, but I think you'll get it. Um, you're attributing all of this to others. So you're attributing uh, this kind of autonomy, you're attributing intentionality. So if somebody says something to you that seems insulting, you may attribute to the other person they intended to insult you. Or if somebody says something about your tribe that seems as though it's humiliating, you might attribute to the other person they intended that. These attributions may be completely wrong, but they are very human and they are really a typical kind of thing that humans do. We defend ourselves, we promote ourselves, we defend our identities, our tribes, our families, and we promote them. And then we also find the, um, the wrong side, the bad side, the difficult side in the other person typically. And so um, that, that configuration of self and other is what makes listening to another person when they go into something you disagree with what makes it so difficult is that your consciousness is trying to sort it out in a way that would be habitual that you're right and the other person is wrong that you're good the other person is bad that your side knows what's going on the other side is stupid that you know how to solve this thing and the other side doesn't so that is, again, a natural tendency. If you could put up this, the next slide, Lori. Um, this also uses one of Carl Jung's ideas and his terminology, which is that in order to form this ego complex, we also have to form what he called the shadow or the shadow complex. And that's the sense that there is otherness and that just as I am, then you are also. And so given this notion that we tend to organize the complexity of the world, which is always a world of opposites, where the opposites are abiding together. This is the world, as I've said many times, of life and death, of good and bad, of right and wrong, of inside and outside, of light and dark, and none of those are separated, but we experience them as split, and we want the good side on our side and the bad side on the outside. And so given that, um, we have this very primary emotional tendency to idealize something and see something else as very bad, something that's terrible and something that's idealized. Uh, it's all over in all of our perceptions, no matter our culture, no matter our language. And then we defend our own primary goodness by projecting the badness to the other, to the outside. And so then we locate our virtues in here and we locate what's destructive out there. And in that way, we all need enemies in order to manage ourselves. And we have a tendency to create those enemies and to sustain that sense of ourselves being good and somebody else being bad, ourselves being right, someone else being wrong, unless we disrupt that tendency. And that disruption is by learning these skills in terms of managing our own subjectivity so that we can tolerate these reactivities in ourselves and keep our ears open even when inside of our minds, we're predicting and we're controlling what we're hearing, 
so that it doesn't go in a direction that we don't want it to go. So I'm going to, that was said sort of not so clearly, but I hope you could grasp it anyway. Um, I have one more slide and then I can go to questions on this. Um, this is a slide that I've used in previous classes and it's a one that I will come back to. So given this whole organization of ego and shadow, of right and wrong, of a tendency to see myself as on the good side of the issue and somebody else on the bad side of the issue, given all of that, we have to master our subjective experience consciously or unconsciously, we will repetitively, repetitively, repetitively create war. And that war will always be based on our ideals. It will always be based on what we think is virtuous, what we think is true and right. And there will always be another side that is on the wrong side because we are hardwired to create this ego and this otherness or hardwired to find things that are wrong before we can see things that are right and to remember what's wrong or hardwired to actually tell ourselves over and over again, she did this to me, he did that to me, he abused me, he oppressed me, they did these wrong things to our family. They did these wrong things to our tribe. We're hardwired to haunt ourselves with these kinds of narratives. And actually, it's only our conscious awareness that allows us to overcome that. And it's the kind of awareness that, that allows us to step back and to say, just a moment, let me take a deep breath. Let me create a space here in which I can actually listen to my own mind and see what's going on within my own subjective experience so that then I can make room for yours. I can make room for the other side of what is in the room with me, of what needs to be understood. And so what I'm suggesting here is that when you listen to someone who really disagrees with you and or someone that you think is intending to harm you the first step is to lower your emotional threat level then to see if you have some mindfulness skills and particularly on listening to another you first have to clear out what you're saying to yourself and you may be saying to yourself you, you, there are a number of things that you can be doing in your own mind when you're listening to a difficult conversation. First of all, you can be commenting on the other person's wrongness. You can say what's wrong, what's going wrong with the other person. You can start to rehearse what you're about to say. You can actually completely mishear what the other person is saying because you think you've heard it all before and you're listening to your own narration of it. You can also mishear what they're saying because you're attributing to them motives that are not theirs. So the very first step in listening is to clear out what you're saying to yourself and to allow that to sort of drop into the background. Sometimes you can allow it to become kind of white noise. It's just like blah, blah, blah back there that you, you may even know you're blah, blah, blah. You're kind of running that tape. And then you open your ears to hear out, to hear actually the sounds that the other person is making. And you have some curiosity about those sounds. And then you try to cultivate a little compassion, just a little bit of stepping into that person's shoes and seeing, oh, this person has a world also. This person grew up in a family. This person also has a point of view and wants to be happy. This person has a way of seeing the world. And this person also has all of these different tendencies that I have as well. A tendency to protect herself, to promote herself, to see herself 
as afraid under certain conditions, et cetera. So it's a matter of keeping your ear open, keeping your ear open through mindfulness and concentration. That's equanimity and concentration so that you clear out your ears. Now, once you've done that, then you have to test and see if you've done a good job. And the way you always test is by asking the other person if you understand. So, you know, in here, in a difficult conversation, it's best if the components are sort of chunked so that the other person has um, a chance to hear what you're understanding. And sometimes that can't happen and sometimes it can. But sometimes you can say to the other person, you know, I'd like to tell you what I'm understanding from what you're saying. And then what you do is you say, so here's what I'm understanding. I'm understanding that you see it this way, that you're looking at this this way. Did I get it? Am I getting it? And then if the other person says, yes, you got it, fine. Then you can say, tell me more. And then if the person says, no, you didn't get it, then you need to say, so help me, help me hear it again. Tell me what it's like from your side. Now, again, nothing is perfect. This won't work perfectly well. If you have a partner in this conversation who knows some of these dialogue skills, then you've got the possibility of going back and forth, each one of you speaking your point of view, speaking for yourself, lowering the emotional threat level, not doing the humiliating, not doing the calling out, and then paraphrasing. Mindful listening, which is what we're really talking about in keeping your ears open, involves pausing and paraphrasing and checking out. And so when you're able to use the skills of real dialogue, speaking for yourself, listening mindfully, it becomes a test of your own ability to use the skill of mindfulness at a time that you're emotionally activated. And then you can begin to see how well you work with your own snow globe. Can you tolerate your own agitated emotions? Can you postpone your own desire to defend yourself? Can you keep your ears open to the other person with that framework of oneness, that this other person is a part of you, that yourself is interactive? It's not located inside of you. You need the other person. In order to become yourself, you need the back and forth. You need the opportunity of being paraphrased yourself. You need to find out how the other person sees you ultimately as well. Because we deceive ourselves so readily because of our ego complex and because we want to feel that we're right and that others are wrong. And this again leads to repetitive, repetitive conflicts, difficult conversations that never come to an end because we can't seem to listen to the other side. And when you can listen, and when you hear, oh, you got it right, there's a tremendous relief for both sides because then you feel we're both human beings. We're in this together. We can work this out together. We don't have an enemy. We have actually another human being with all of the flawed difficulties of being human we're in this together. We can work with species. So that's kind of my, my sort of, I would say, I always feel like I, I'm almost preaching, like I'm a preacher about dialogue, about the capacities that we have to actually listen through a difficult conversation. If we cultivate mindfulness, compassion, we have a natural curiosity about each other. And we can actually find out what somebody thinks, somebody who really disagrees with us, who really gets our goat, who really turns our hackles up. So I think I've said about what I have to say on this. Uh, this is a tough lesson. And I hope you have some questions that I, I think I have a few minutes to answer some questions before 
uh, before the class is over. Yeah, so there are a few. Um, and if we don't get to your questions during the class, Polly will follow up via email. So here's one. It says, uh, going further into the shame question, if you're in a conversation with someone where there is humiliation taking place, how would I respond if I am the one being triggered? So I assume this person is saying that this person is feeling humiliated. And so humiliation is, so shame, let's just say shame and humiliation are these self-conscious emotions in which we can go into a narrative to feel enraged because we feel our social status has been lowered or if we identify with it we feel defective we feel like something's wrong with us and we're out of the game if you actually can allow yourself to simply feel the actual feelings, their body sensations, and they feel like you're falling into a hole. It's actually kind of a, almost like you're dropping down into a black hole. If you can stop the narrative, it takes about 30 seconds to land, and you have a kind of soft landing, and you'll find that you're okay, that you're fine and that you don't have to become enraged. It's that desire not to feel the fullness of that body sensation of being dropped that keeps us from actually going through the emotional experience, which is body sensation, into the end of the shaming experience. And so, there is a way simply to feel the feeling. So feelings, emotions, their body sensations, they arise and pass away. None of them last more than about 30 seconds. Well, then how can we stay enraged for so long? It's through the narrative. The nar in the narrative, we're telling ourselves, oh, he did this to me. She did that to me. This is what this means. This is why I can't tolerate this. We go on with the narrative, and the narrative promotes the ego, because it's the identity, and then the other is still the enemy, and the narrative keeps going. If you can, through your mindfulness, drop the narrative, even momentarily, you'll find that that feeling of humiliation or shame is tolerable. It's just a feeling. It passes quickly. No emotion lasts more than 30 seconds. They come and go. Your inner feelings come and go. That's why you really can't guide yourself by your inner feelings. Um, I, I love to go back to Leonard Cohen's lines from various songs. And, and in one song, I don't remember which one, he says, I know I am forgiven, but I don't know how I know. I don't trust my inner feelings inner feelings come and go. So if you really don't allow yourself to go into a big narrative, you can drop into that feeling and it passes and it will feel like you're falling through the floor, but you won't be. You'll just get a soft landing and you can move on. So that's a, a mindfulness approach to humiliation. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, we're right at five o'clock now, and I just want to say a couple of things before we sign off. Uh, we have session four of Living Together Without Falling Apart this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock, and you don't have to have taken any of the classes prior to, to join, and there are recordings on the website of the previous classes. And then this, this same time next week at four o'clock is both sides now, so we hope you'll join, and these are all in conjunction with the Row Center. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. <laughs>